Hey everyone, I'm Jeremiah Johnston. Welcome back to another broadcast of Christian Thinker Society, a resident institute at Houston Baptist University. Of course, our mission is to teach Christians and pastors to become thinkers and thinkers to become Christians. And for those of you that are joining us for the very first time, we like to expose our audience to the world's brightest thinkers and best leaders, people that are on the cutting edge of both ministry and integration of faith with business, with learning, with higher education, with publishing. And I have been looking so forward to our interview today. I have my very good friend, Dr. Eric Geiger, joining us today from Lifeway Christian Resources. Eric, it is awesome yeah, to have thanks. you in studio with us here at Houston Baptist University. We're broadcasting from Houston, Texas, and I want to encourage you to check out our website, christianthinkers.com, and be sure to click on that YouTube channel where you can see videos of all kinds. Again, we take your questions. So on that website, just click on Ask a Question, and you can submit your question to me. We answer all of those questions. We've received over 5,000 questions from believers, skeptics, seekers, uh, and people from all walks of life. So we look forward to answering your questions. You're going to so enjoy this interview today. Dr. Eric Geiger is a leadership guru, and I first heard about Eric through his excellent book, Simple Church. This was a book during my first master's at seminary. Uh, that was assigned to my class, and it was one of the most helpful books in the local church context because it discusses the importance of why we do what we do. And if you're a pastor, if you don't have Simple Church on your shelf, you need to go buy it right now. Of course, I have the updated edition. This is a best-selling book, uh, and Dr. Geiger has done a marvelous job, and he'll tell us more about it, looking at why we do what we do at church, and does it really help the mission? Uh, Eric is also the author of a book Audrey loves, my wife, we both enjoy it, called Identity, Who Are You in Christ? And then several other books. This is representative, certainly not uh, exhaustive of all his publications. Then Transformational Groups, a book he co-authored. Eric has a wonderful wife, Kay, two daughters, Evie and Eden. He comes to us from Nashville, Tennessee. Eric, thank you for being Man, with thanks us. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Okay, Eric, you have this blog that everybody needs to sign up for and read. It's at ericgeiger.com. I read it every single day. He's constantly putting things out. And not only if you're a pastor, if you are a business leader, if you're involved in leadership of any kind, you will be interested in uh, what Eric has to say at ericgeiger.com. So be sure and go there, and we'll link to it in the blog post uh, for this video. Eric, how did you get interested in leadership? You're known as a guru in the church and in the business world, so what, what brought you into leadership, and, and tell us about your journey. Man, I, uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that, that, uh, <laughs> that, that question, so, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking, how, how did I first start getting interested in leadership? I, I hadn't read a leadership book um, until actually uh, getting my doctorate at, at Southern Seminary, so I, wow. looking back, I see that a lot of the things I was doing was leadership but I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't have the same vocabulary then that I that I have now in terms of leadership definitions and uh, for me uh, I, I really was a pastor and so wanting to lead the people well that I was that I was shepherding and the, and the, the team that I was leading so the the uh, when I was getting my doctorate the the staff that that I was leading was growing significantly in size because our church was growing growing at that time at, at a rapid pace and a rapid click and so I really wanted to serve the people that I was mm -hmm. leading well, and so I, you know, I started reading a lot of, a lot of leadership books. And it, it, but understanding that, I, and I love the, the mission of of, uh, of what you're doing to help Christians think and thinkers become Christian, <laughs> uh, because some of the times what um, is in a book on leadership is not necessarily, and oftentimes not, not Christian, right? So That's you want to you want to read it through a, yeah. a Christian worldview, realizing that. Uh, the role of a leader in a church is to is, is going to be to, to serve the people, but it's also going to be to oversee, to shepherd, to give mm -hmm. direction. And so a lot of what um, a pastor or shepherd in a church does has some leadership rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I first got got um, involved in, in really reading a lot and studying a lot about, about leadership to, to really, hopefully, the end result would have healthier churches. Absolutely. And again, check out ericgeiger.com. That's ericgeiger.com because there's so much more we can discuss. You, you have really nuanced, though, leadership and the integration of leadership. I want to ask you a question that I'm asked from time to time, and I want to hear your take on it. When somebody's watching this broadcast right now and they're saying, you know, I'm not a leader. I wasn't a born leader. Well, how would you respond to that? And is leadership a spiritual gift? Yeah, that's great. So that's, that's a debate people have all the time. Are leaders born or made? Mm -hmm. And uh, Oswald Sanders and his, his classic work called Spiritual Leadership, it's a phenomenal read. He says the answer is both. 
Hmm. And so there, wow. for sure, there is, you, you can tell, I mean, some people, I mean, you, you have little girls, you can tell that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, real quickly, there's, uh, even in kindergarten, there, there's natural leaders yeah. that, uh, that rise up, right? And so that's, I'd say that's God-given, though. That's God-given abilities that he gives, he gives people. And then there is the, uh, the rebirth that happens when we become his. And mm -hmm. so I, I believe my, my ecclesiology would be that the moment someone becomes a believer, God gifts that person uh, with a spiritual gift and to serve the body, to serve mm -hmm. the church. And in Romans chapter 12, leadership is listed as if, if, right. if he can govern diligently, let him govern diligently. So mm -hmm. there's a sense that, that leadership's a natural gift given by God at, at birth, even before someone becomes a believer. And then there's also this supernatural gifting. Uh, he, gives, he gifts everybody, but he mm -hmm. gifts some with this gift of, of leadership. And then there is a sense, if you define leadership, and many have defined it this way, that leadership is influence. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense that all Christians, in some regard, are leading in that we're influencing. Mm -hmm. So we want to influence our neighbors, we want to influence our families, we want to influence the people we work alongside. And so even if someone feels like they're not a leader in terms of overseeing a large organization or mm -hmm. a large team. They still are a leader in the sense of influencing people. And so that that's distinctly Christian, right? Absolutely. We, we want to we influence people for His glory, for the kingdom of God to expand it. Mm. I want to stay in this leadership uh, lane for a few moments. You know, you oversee, you give leadership to the world's largest Christian publisher, that's Lifeway uh, Christian Resources, b and Publishing, b and Academic, and Word Search Bible Software. What are you looking for as a leader, as a pastor, when you interview people, mm -hmm. when you mentor younger people? What are those qualities, both intangible that you're looking for, but also the teachable things that you're looking for to evaluate? I think that would help yeah. our audience. Yeah. Well, it, when I'm hiring, uh, I mean, there's people have used the C's uh, before, and, and we've got a Baptist they're, here. They're, uh, yeah, this yeah, is, we're going to alliterate. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it, it can be a helpful framework, and so sometimes I, I, I kind of run my mind through it when I'm hiring character. I look for character first and foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Paul told Timothy in Second Timothy two two, the things that you've heard me say, and trust a faithful man who will be able to teach others. Mm -hmm. So you have both character and competence. Will be able, but he starts mm -hmm. with character faithful That's good. who will be able. He, he doesn't say, fine, able, and hope they are faithful. Mm -hmm. I go find some able people, some competent people, and work with them in their character. He says the opposite. Find, find people of character, and then they, they will be able. Mm -hmm. So I, I look for character, but I do look for competence. And so sure. I, I look for, for people who are going to be skilled in their, in their roles. And oftentimes, uh, when we're hiring people for a role, uh, you, you, you're, you're hiring someone who wasn't in that exact role before. So you look, I look for transferable skills, Absolutely. things that are transferable from one context to another. Chemistry is big for me, That's good. I, really important. I actually will put chemistry even ahead of, ahead of mm -hmm. confidence because I want the team to be, to be enhanced by each person who's brought on the team. And so mm -hmm. for us, for me, I'm looking for shared values. Does this mm -hmm. person already believe the values and the mission, the identity that we've put our, our stake in the ground for? Absolutely. Is this person already aligned? I don't, if someone has to sacrifice who they are to be on the team, then, they, then they're not going to be fulfilled. They're not going to mm -hmm. be happy. They're, they're just trying to get a job. Yeah. So I'm not looking for people who just want to get a job. And then the last uh, is c capacity. Can somebody, um, I'm looking for scalers. Mm. Can somebody scale and, and, and grow as we grow, right? Mm -hmm. So can somebody, uh, do they tackle a new, a new thing? Do they learn a new skill? How did they handle stress last time? Yeah. Do, do they like every now and then having a season of being overwhelmed because mm -hmm. that's when they're going to really learn and grow? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for someone who can grow their capacity. Wow. They're going awesome. to they're gonna be able to handle more two years from now than they, because they're going to have more responsibility two years that's from right. now than they, than they currently do um, if we're successful, if we accomplish the mission that we, that we really feel the Lord's given us. So mm -hmm. I need to know now, are you, are you going to be ready for more two years, two years, two years in? Mm -hmm. Powerful. I want to talk to millennials for a moment. We have quite a following among millennials at Christian Thinker Society and Houston Baptist University. So, I'm a millennial. Are you a millennial? Would you qualify as a millennial? I, I, I Are you I'm on actually, the? I'm, I'm, I think I've aged out. Okay, he's I've, aged out. I've aged out of that. <laughs> talk to millennials for a moment because there's so much that's been written about millennials not being able to take correction and to be corrected and improved and mm -hmm. take it uh, constructively. 
How important is it as we develop the gifts that God has given us, both natural and supernatural, we've already heard about the spiritual gift, Romans chapter 12 of leadership, how important is it to be able to have those people in your life, Eric, that bring things into sharper focus in your life that can be improved? Can you talk about a minute, and how have, how have you received that, and how do you model mm -hmm. that uh, yep. for others? That's good. Well, it, without feedback and correction, you, you won't become who you, who you could be mm -hmm. if you had it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reality. Uh, there, there's a book, Talent is Overrated, mm. and basically it, the, in it the, uh, the authors talk about how you, you can have talent, but if you don't have deliberate practice is the, is the term that they, they coin, deliberate practice, you won't become as skilled in any discipline or any, any industry as you, as you would be if you had deliberate mm -hmm. practice, and part of deliberate practice is feedback, coaching. Mm -hmm. So someone who doesn't want feedback and coaching is not going to, 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 to be developed. Development mm -hmm. includes being, being coached and, and having feedback. Uh, my experience with, with millennials is that they, they receive feedback mm -hmm. and they receive coaching when it's in relationships with people they trust yes. and respect. Yes. So, uh, you know, they, 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 I know there's stuff written about millennials not wanting authority and, and whatnot. I, I have found that when there is a trusting relationship and they know that someone cares of them, that they're, mm -hmm. they're much, they're, like, like all of us, we're mm -hmm. much more likely to receive Absolutely. feedback in, in, that, in that moment. So, but if you really want to develop and grow, you have to, you have to cherish and long for feedback. Mm -hmm. Again, my guest, Dr. Eric Geiger, he is the Vice President leadership, uh, and Leadership Guru at Lifeway Christian Resources. If you're just joining us, I want you to follow him on Twitter right now at Eric Geiger, at Eric Geiger, and then his website, ericgeiger.com. We're talking about leadership. And Eric, I want you to speak to a moment um, to our audience about the importance of leadership in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's something that we're all looking for. How do you, how do you, you know, you're someone who really models this. You have a demanding schedule. You're in demand as a speaker, as an author. You have a large organization you're giving leadership to. And now you're a senior pastor of a vibrant church mm -hmm. in Franklin, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. How do you negotiate a busy schedule, being a father with your marriage, and, and bring the leadership that the home needs? Yeah. And what are some pearls that you can drop on us uh, yeah. for how we can follow your leadership in that area? When, when I first was going into ministry, someone, someone told me, um, I think during my ordination council, you know, when the, before mm -hmm. the church would put their stamp of approval on you, that Eric, uh, don't neglect your family. If you lose uh, your ministry, you, you can, you can lose your ministry and recovery. Lo you lose your family. You'll lose both your family and, and your ministry. Good. And it, 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 it was really simple, but really, really stuck mm -hmm. with me. You mm -hmm. know, 1 Timothy 3, mm -hmm. one of the qualifications in the, in the list of being an elder or, or a pastor mm -hmm. is to, to lead one's family well, to manage one's household. If you can't manage your own household, how can you manage the household of God, is what mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul says to Timothy in that passage. So, First, it's got to come from a deep conviction. You know, someone can mm -hmm. be given like, hey, here's seven things to do, but that's just going to be a list that quickly gets lost yeah. if there's not this, this like deeply held conviction that I must pastor my family and lead my family before mm -hmm. I attempt to influence anybody else. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, that's a deep, you know, deep conviction for me. My, the most important meeting that I will lead this week will be with my family. The mm -hmm. most important small group I'll be involved in will be with my family. The most important... Uh, conversation I'll have will be with will be with my family so just having that is a, as a conviction is 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 important and, I, and from a from a missional standpoint from from thinking of as a missionary in our culture a healthy godly family uh, is already but it w is going to become increasingly more so just such a beautiful reflection of the gospel absolutely for, for me to love my wife and her to love me for me to shepherd my kids. It, it, it's a beautiful picture to my, to my mm -hmm. neighborhood, to, to where I live, to my community. Um, but practically speaking for, for, uh, for Kay, my, my wife's name's Kay, and, and our girls, uh, it's, we just prioritize time a mm -hmm. lot. So I'm, I'm, I'm careful, with the, careful with the schedule and, and uh, block off nights each week where it's just going to mm -hmm. be daddy, daughter time or yep. dad, mom and dad time. And I take each kid on a trip uh, once a year. Just, just you two? Just me and the girl. Wow. Uh, so I'm taking, taking Eden, my oldest, to Disney World mm. um, coming up in a couple of weeks. So it's, uh, for me, I want, I, and obviously, you know, we'll, we read the Bible together and pray together, but 
I really want to spend a lot of time with them because I feel kind of like the millennial question, really. Yeah. If, I, if I don't have this, this, this time and trust, uh, then what they hear me say, it, well, Daddy's doing that because he's a, he's a pastor. Mm -hmm. I want them to really know I, yeah. that, I love, that I love and care for him. And really the most spiritual conversations that we've had um, so far, and they're only eight and six, <laughs> but the most spiritual conversations we have have actually been at the, at the random times in the car or mm -hmm. on a daddy's exactly. trip. You know, they haven't been these forced moments at the, yes. at the table during devotional time. You know, mm. they've been, they've really flown, they've really uh, grown out of the relationship. Mm, beautiful. You know, my takeaway from that is leadership in the home is spelled T-I-M-E, mm. and you're preaching to me right now first. Um, I want to ask you a question because I brought this up in the Bible study just briefly that I did with Unanswered. You can check it out at lifeway.com slash unanswered. Uh, to maintain mental balance and mental health and leadership in the home, I want you to speak to our audience. We have uh, hundreds of megachurch pastors that regularly watch these videos as well as other leaders in the marketplace. How important is the word no as a leader? I mean, I feel honored to have you here today in Houston. Um, how do you navigate that, and how important is it to say no for the bigger yes of some of these things you're discussing? So saying no in terms of home, leading at the home? Yeah, just yeah. not saying yes to every single opportunity. That's so yeah. hard because yeah. we all, you know, as men, we want to get ahead. We want to provide for our family. How do you, how do you know? Yeah. What's your barometer for that? Uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. It, and it really is time, time with the kids. So just a couple of recent no's mm -hmm. um, that there, there's, a, there's a guy that came to me after uh, church the other day and was like, Hey, I, I need to get with you right away. He has, you know, mm -hmm. has this big thing he wants to talk to me about, and I said, uh, "Hey, if you if you email, my my sister can work out a time." And then, but he is it's not quick enough for him, so he's saying, "Can I have a night with you this week?" Mm. And it's it's no. Yeah. And I I know it it sounds hard to say say no, but in my head, the the way I could say no was. Um, if I said yes to him, I was saying no to my girls. Exactly. So, so to say yes to that, I would, ha I would have had to tell my girls no that night. So that's a, that's a, that's a no that's happened mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks. But then we're also right now looking at, um, I have one daughter who wants to do swimming and one daughter who wants to do dance, and, but then she wants to do something else too, and, and realizing that we're gonna, there's times now where we're going to say no. Mm -hmm. we, want, we don't want them doing, we don't want to be running around every night of the week. So we're going to let them do one thing at a time yeah. and no to... That's good. To other things, because we still want to be together as a family, you know, mm -hmm. and, not, and not just run from meeting to meeting. Not just my mm -hmm. schedule, but I'm th their schedule's starting to get, get yeah. pulled on. I told my wife the other day she's an Uber driver for our kids now. That's what she does. <laughs> so it's we're, we're all Uber drivers for our children. But she doesn't, get, she doesn't get paid extra coins. No, she doesn't. She, she doesn't. So um, I want to transition for a minute. Eric, you have been such an encouragement to me personally and just getting to know you, and, but also your example. I've obviously read your book, Simple Church, a few times. Our whole staff at our church has read it. Um, I want to talk to you a minute, though, about what you said at the beginning. Jesus has asked... Uh, in Matthew 22, 37, he's approached, and again, this is the Son of God. He knows everything. He's omniscient. And he's asked, Jesus, teacher, rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know this with all your soul. And he says, with all your mind. And, you know, we have mindless Christianity happening mm -hmm. right now. And this gets back to leadership. I think there's some points of tangency there. Talk for a minute about how important it is as a leader, and you're in a capacity as a pastor, a publisher, a father, to be a thinking leader. Yeah. How important is it to follow what Jesus said, to love the Lord our God, yes, with our heart and soul, but also with our mind? Mm -hmm. um, can you just uh, yeah, drop absolutely. some wisdom on us with that? So oftentimes to me, what, what a leader in a, in, a, in a ministry setting, even in a non-ministry setting, when it comes to thinking, uh, really is thinking about strategy or direction or here's here's how we're going to accomplish mm -hmm. the mission that our organization or our church has and and if a if a leader doesn't do that it's really burdensome for the people mm -hmm. so Im imagine a uh, a football coach who who gets in front of the team uh the first it's a high school football coach and he gets in front of the team you know for spring training and says hey here's our vision this is what we're going to do we're going to win and we're just going to win big 
and everybody's like, yeah, and they, they're chest bumping, <laughs> high-fiving, and then they start practice, and then it gets in the summer, and there's, there's two-a-days, and hey, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, let me remind you what we're about. We're going to win. We're just going to win. That's what we're going to do. We're going to win around here. We're going to win big. And then the first Friday night game comes, and the, the team goes to the line, and the coaches pull them together one more time, say, let's win, let's win, let's win, and there's, there's no plays. They, they, mm. They've kind of gone mindlessly through the practices mm -hmm. and, and done drills that everyone does, done tackling mm -hmm. drills that everyone does, but, but the coach hasn't taught and said, okay, this is what we do on third down typically. Mm -hmm. Here's the defense we're going to run. Here's the plays we're going to call. I feel like sometimes in churches, pastors get up in front of the people and say, hey, let's go win. Let's go make disciples. Mm, let's go good. advance the kingdom. But then, do, but then don't take the time to do the strategic thinking beneath the surface on That's good. here's who we are as a people in our community. Look, look, look around us. This mm -hmm. is where God's placed us. Let's strategically think, how are we going to make disciples in this area? How are we going to align all of the resources we have? That, that's the hard work of strategy. And, and I think for some pastors, that, that word strategy is, mm. it feels like this really nebulous. Or, that's not or, an unspiritual term, is it? No, it's not. Not, not, when you, <laughs> not when you look at Romans 12 and there's govern diligently or right. oversee. You know? um, whether you use the, word, the term strategy or not, you still as a leader have to actually provide a how Mm -hmm. for this big what that you're declaring. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I think you really are burdening the people with, with uh, go do this, go do this, and, it, and, and people are actually looking for a play to be drawn mm -hmm. up on, here's, here's how as a church we, we're going to fulfill this, this grand mission that we want to give our, our hearts to. We, we want to put money in the plate to this. We want to do yeah. this, um, but for there to be a picture painted of how. Mm, powerful. Again, we're talking to Dr. Eric Geiger. Vice President at Lifeway Christian Resources and Publishing. And we've been having such an interesting discussion. I know you're going to want to share this video on your social streams and probably listen to it more than one time. Um, we're talking about the importance of being a Christian thinker. And Eric, I want to ask you, you know, Max Dupree said in his book, Leadership is an Art, that famous mm -hmm. quote that leaders define reality. That's my yep. paraphrase of it. So a reality that we work with here at Christian Thinker Society in Houston Baptist University, though we are a wonderful, comprehensive Division I university, we have students that walk into the class freshmen, they know nothing about the Bible. Uh, they know nothing about the story of the Bible. They know very little, if anything, about Jesus of Nazareth. And then when we take that scope and we broaden it to what North America looks like, the biblical illiteracy, I, I call it we're living in a time really of Bible-ish Christianity. Mm -hmm. I was at a church growth conference and the pastor who, if I said his name, everybody would recognize it, stood up and said he doesn't preach the Bible because that's boring. Oh, man. So it was difficult for me to hear mm -hmm. as an exegete. So my question to you, defining reality, what, is, what, are, you here, what are you learning at Lifeway and, and what, what is the mission of Lifeway specifically for the next generation that's struggling with biblical illiteracy? You all do such excellent work. Yeah. Uh, to combat that? How are you combating biblical literacy? Well, the, the, the stats are, are, are terrifying. When you have, I read one recently, like 82% of Americans believe that God helps those who help themselves is mm -hmm. a verse in the Bible. Yeah. Which is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. <laughs> exactly. you know, with that, that, that God helps those of us who realize we're, we're helpless and, right. and cry out for mercy and grace. Uh, there's a plethora of things that we do mm -hmm. to really press into that, to that need. So, we publish Bible studies, such as mm -hmm. what, we, what we've done with you, to really equip small groups and, yes. and groups of Christians who gather together, whether it's in a small group or a discipleship group or a Sunday school class. And our team works really, really hard to, to, to root those studies in the Word. So mm -hmm. we, we would say the opposite of what that pastor said. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, 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 we believe the Bible is, is life-giving and, and thrilling. It is the story of God mm -hmm. and how He rescues us. And it is the truth of God that transforms us. And so... Mm -hmm. It, to me, if you have a group of people gathering and they're not gathering on the Word, you're going to have an unsanctified group of people. That's because right. Because Jesus, yeah. Jesus said in John 17, He prays to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your mm. Word is truth. And so if we are building community apart from the Scripture, we are building shallow, shallow community. Mm. And community is only as strong as whatever it stands on. Yeah. And so we want, we want the small groups that we serve, the churches that we serve, to, be, to stand on the truth the truth of God's mm -hmm. word. You know, Paul, I know I'm preaching a little bit here, but Paul, it. Paul it uh, told, told the church at, in Colossae, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'll be able to speak in psalms and spiritual songs to one another and be filled with gladness in your heart. Mm -hmm. So if you, want a, if you want a church, a group of people that admonishes one another in wisdom, that is 
filled with joy and gladness and mm -hmm. sings to each other and encourages each other. I mean, everyone wants that kind of community where you have to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly mm -hmm. to get that, that kind of community. So I'd say, Jeremiah, all that we're, we do in terms of our publishing, in terms of resources we provide, and, and all the events that we, yeah. that we, we put on, it's actually one of our values. Mm -hmm. you know, I talked about hiring awesome. people based on a value. The a value that we have is root everything in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So we want, we want everything to really be drenched in in the Word of God. I was in a meeting the other day and uh, we had a, one of our marketing teams come in and do a presentation for a, a campaign we're gonna do. And th the campaign doesn't have verses in it, but before the, uh, the, the, the uh, marketer showed the campaign options, he quoted these, these verses, pulled C.S. Lewis and Augustine and said, okay, that's the heartbeat behind this campaign. Mm. Now let me show you what it's like. And I, I stopped the meeting and said, guys, this is what I want you to see. That right there is the value, root everything Good. in Scripture. Even if it doesn't, even if it, you won't need to find a verse for choosing a color that you choose in the campaign, mm -hmm. but that the thinking beneath the surface, that the heart beneath the surface is we're going to take people to, to the sacred text because only the text transforms hearts. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the value that we're, that we're looking for. That's powerful. And I want to say this as a Lifeway author, I found that churches, organizations, they take on the personality of their leaders. Mm -hmm. And I want to compliment you and your team. It was so collaborative working on the Unanswered Bible Study, and it was drenched not only in the Word, but in prayer. Mm -hmm. And it was a coll creative collaboration. That's awesome. And it's awesome to partner with a publishing company like Lifeway that wants more of the Word, not less. Yeah. They don't want to water it down. They don't want to dumb it down. That's the problem with Christianity Day being mindless. We need to stop insulting people. We have, a, we have the smartest Christians of all time attending your and my churches. Hmm. And yet they're the most biblically illiterate. They want more and they can rise to the challenge. I've found they want to. Um, Eric, we could talk all day, uh, but just in the remaining minutes, I want to ask you one final question. And again, you can follow Eric, Eric Geiger at ericgeiger.com for his blog, and you can follow him on Twitter at Eric Geiger. Talk to us about this gospel project that is going out to millions yeah. of people. And that's something I've just learned about recently that I'm very interested in. Can you talk about the inception and architecture and the impact that project is making? And we'll land the plane with that. Man, it, 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 it blew up, and it's really a an incredible story. It's one of those, man, you want to be a part of things in your life where you look and you're like, wow, that, that's just something the Lord did. It's just mm -hmm. something God did. So right when I was going to Lifeway, we had three different um, curriculum lines that were about to start that were, that were separated, uh, all great, kids, students, and adults, but they all had, they had one thing in common. It would, they were going to bring people to the whole storyline of Scripture, how everything, how everything points mm -hmm. to Jesus, how everything brings us to the, the, the narrative that we need to be rescued by him and that he's the fulfillment of, of everything, you know, mm -hmm. that it all points to, to Christ. So we, we got every, all those three teams together and said, let's, let's go together, kids, students, and adults, with this, this curriculum. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a three-year scope and sequence, 18 months in the Old Testament, 18 months in the New Testament. But, but the, the rhythm, so it, it's a theologically-minded study in mm -hmm. that you kind of you systematically walk through Scripture but it's also done in a chronological way. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really good because you have the discipline of a systematic theology and a chronological yeah. study happening at the same time, Powerful. pointing people to Jesus. And it's, it's just blown up. We've had churches, uh, we have a, over a million people now yeah. who, every single week who use the Gospel Project. And we're, we're hearing incredible, I, I taught a group of um, uh, young couples for um, about 18 months using the Gospel Project. And it, you just, it just, Martin Luther said, most important is that we know this gospel well, mm -hmm. teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> exactly. And Luther, <laughs> Luther, I love that. I love yep. that quote from Luther. And, and that's what I found leading the gospel project with, with my group for 18 months. It's like every single week we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're telling the story in a new way, a new way because we're looking at a different story in Scripture that all points to the ultimate story. And hmm. it, it, it ultimately crushes people's hearts. Ed, Edmund Clowney said that it's possible to know the Bible stories and miss the Bible story, mm. which is really scary that we can have a bunch of people in churches who know stories of the Bible, but, but know this story and this story and this story, but don't see how they connect together yes. and how they point people to Jesus. And so the, the heart of the Gospel Project is let's, have, let's see what happens in our churches and our communities when people know the Bible story and their hearts are 
are crushed over and over again with the reality that, that Jesus loves us and became our righteousness and took away our sin. It's beautiful. You've been watching another broadcast of Christian Thinker Society, a resident institute here at Houston Baptist University. Again, share this video, listen to it again. Uh, Eric, on behalf of um, pastors, hundreds of them that watch this, myself as a professor, it just it gr brings me great delight to know that you're at Lifeway and just the Thanks, way man. that God is using you to impact millions through your leadership of other leaders. And I want to thank you. I want to tell you what an honor it is to, to just know you and to have you on this program. I appreciate it. We're going to pray for you. We're going to affirm you. We're going to follow you on Twitter and keep, keep gleaning from you what you drop on us. I want to encourage you to get Simple Church. If you, if you haven't, uh, Eric has several other resources that would just be wonderful uh, for your church, for your group, and for you personally. Uh, until next time, so long. We'll catch you another time.